homes where we think nothing is happening outside, but there are people who are suffering, people who are struggling, people who are in pain, people who are hurting. God said, I don't care about you having it, but be concerned about those who don't have it. You know, we live in a time now where everybody that has, they don't want to give anything to to the ones who don't have. But God says this is problem. It's a problem with you. It's a problem with you, fellas. He says so. It's going to lead to a significant situation for you. He says in verse number seven. Therefore, they will now go into exile at the head of the exiles, and the sprawler's banquet will pass away. He says, since you are the leader, since you are the men. He says, I already told your wives what I'm going to do. I'm going to take your wives. Some of them are going to be on fish hooks pull them through the wall. He says, but what I'm going to do with you, since you are the leaders, I'm going to let you lead those and you're going to be the ones who are going into exile first. Since you are living luxurious lifestyle, you're living like the rich and famous and you don't care about anybody else. You don't care who's hurting. You don't care about reaching out and reaching down to help somebody else. All you're doing is sprawling back, laying there, getting your massage, eating your lamb and your steak, drinking your wine out of the best glasses. You're doing your own thing while your wives are in there. They don't bother us. We don't bother them. We're all chilling, doing our own thing. He says, the problem, what I'm going to do is I am going to send you into exile first. He says, I'm going to have your wives then pull through the walls and everything else to show you that you didn't get here by yourself. Now, the problem with this is how these are, these are chosen people of God. Listen, listen, these are the people that God picked to be his. And he's about to do this to the people that he has chosen to be brothers and sisters, let me say this. How is it that, that these distinguished men of these distinguished gentlemen of Israel could, could act such a way? How is it that these cows of Basin, these wives could act that way knowing what their history is like? They know what it's like to be under oppression because they were under oppression by Pharaoh and the Egyptians. They know what it's like to be mistreated. They know what it's like to see folk living it up and then you were out there slaving in the field so that they can live it up. Yet they have forgotten where they have come from. Brothers and sisters, I have a sneaky suspicion. I have a sneaky suspicion that some of us are living so good now that we've forgotten where we have come from. And we are treating people like we used to be treated. God says the problem with this is that I picked you to be my own, so I expect you to treat folk differently. I expect you to act differently. I expect you to think differently. He says, you can't keep acting like this. in the text as we get ready to close this they fail to see the consequences because God says you know what I'm going to do you're going to experience death, destruction and defeat verses 8 through 10 he says this to them he says the Lord God has sworn by himself the Lord God of hosts has declared I loathe the arrogance of Jacob and detest his citadels Therefore, I will deliver up the city and all it contains. Can you imagine Amos telling these people this in their temple? And he's from Tekoa, from another place. And he has the audacity to show up in the northern kingdom and tell them, God about to get you. God is about to get. And, and then he says, notice how he, he pronounces this. He says, I loathe the arrogance of Jacob, in parenthesis, which would suggest Amos is saying, this is not what I'm saying. I'm just telling you what the Lord is saying. And that's how I preach my sermon. I preach them in parenthesis. This is what the Lord is saying. It's not me. I mean, don't get mad at Amos. They are upset with Amos, but Amos said, did I not tell you in chapter one, he was roaring from Zion. It's not me. It's him. But you know how it is. We're not bold enough to point our finger at God so we get mad at the preacher. He picking on me. No. That book. So if you're going to get mad, let's get mad at the word. He says, and it will be, if ten men are left, verse 9, in one house, they will die. 
he says, but then they're going to send a relative in. He's going to come in and say, anybody left? Anybody left? And one who is still survival will say, I'm still here. And the relative is going to say, hey, do not say the name of the Lord in here. Because we don't know if he's going to show up and take us out or what. So don't, don't, what, don't breathe it. Don't. Let, let me just see. He, he says this. Then one's uncle or his undertaker will lift up to carry out his bones from the house. And he will say to the one who is in the innermost part of the house, is anyone else here? And that one will say, no one. Then he will answer, keep quiet, for the name of the Lord is not to be mentioned. Don't you say it. Because he might, as if, they, as if God, I guess they think they're sneaking in. God don't see him. You know how we, we think God is in heaven. He can't see me. I just do it. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. So they sneak in. I guess they say, Shh, so God don't hear. That's what the Bible says. And then, but then he says, if, if, if there are 11 in, 10 of them are going to die. But watch what else he says. The destruction that he's going to exact on them in verses 11 through 13, he says this. For behold, the Lord is going to command that the great house be smashed to pieces and the small house to fragments. He says, do horses run on rocks or does one plow them with oxen? Yet you have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. He is saying, Israel, you've done the unimaginable. He says, a horse doesn't run on rocks. They're not, they're not designed to run on rocks because it would harm them. He says, does an oxen plow with the oxen? There's one plow with the ox. He says, that's not how it happens. He says, you've done the unimaginable. He says, so what's going to happen is the Lord is going to smash. Oh, now, mind he said this earlier. You have these nice homes and these beach homes and your winter home. And he says, I'm going to destroy them. Now he says, I'm going to smash them. He says, now, I didn't have a problem with you having them as long as you got them the right way. The problem I have is that you didn't get them the right way, Israel. He says, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to smash them. This is God saying what he's going to do to the people that he has chosen. Beloved, what do you think he is going to do to us if we are on his side call? Now, I, the, the sinner already has a judgment, but can you imagine how he views us when we are messing up on him? When you marry this to contemporary, you have to see God says, you can't be on my team and live any kind of way. I'm almost done. I know I've worked you long enough. He says, you who rejoice in Lodabar and then say we have not, uh, have we not by our own strength taken carnum for ourselves? Lodabar represents nothing. If you read Second Samuel, you know it means nothing. That's what Mephibosheth was. He says, there ain't anybody left of the house of David that I may show you kind of Saul, that I may show you kindness of. David is looking for somebody from Saul's house. Mephibosheth runs down to Lodabar and says, no, hey, they says it is one, but he's in Lodabar. His name is Mephibosheth. He's crippled, lame in both feet. He says, bring him to the table. 